Okay, so <coughs> I'm going to switch gear a little bit, and we're going to talk about ocean models. And I'm going to give a um, brief uh, status of uh, ocean modeling, and then uh, Julien Le Sommer in uh, other lectures will go in more depth in some of those uh, concepts. So what are ocean models? What are they used for? And first and foremost is to what I call scientifically rationals, rationalize the real ocean. So you use idealized or realistic uh, configuration to try to understand and address the specific scientific question that can be based on uh, observations so other things. In the context of uh, Godet and this school, we're using the models together with data simulation and observations to make uh, predictions, like forecast mesoscale features or the you know, define a little bit more long-term uh, processes. And then the outputs of those forecasts can be used to make, um, you know, advice, uh, provide, uh, um, you know, try to, you know, how to manage ocean resources and everything. So, observational data together via data simulation allows you to provide uh, forecast. But what's important to keep, you know, always uh, keep in mind is that the quality of the estimates and the forecast are going to be extremely dependent on the capability of the ocean models to reproduce uh, observations. So that first and foremost, if you have a bad ocean models that is biased, your forecast is going to be biased. What's important to see also is just that your grid that is going to uh, represent uh, reality is. Um, you're going to be able to represent some features and some others that are smaller than the grid size of your model are not going to be well represented. So they need to be parameterized. And that has a strong impact on the uh, capability of the model to represent features. There is also, you know, like, you can have as much observations if your model is biased, your forecast is going to be biased. So a few things. Models, numerical models, are not reality, and it depends a lot on the amount of computational power you have, on the subgrid scale parameterization that you use. The forcing fields are often not very well known. I mean, you you know, we hear about the winds, so you can be the uh, atmospheric fields and so on. And then you have an ocean model does not exist by itself. It needs to interact with uh, um, ice, with the atmosphere, with land, with waves, and so on. But one need to also realize, like Rosemary mentioned, I mean, you know, the observations have a limitation as well. They have gaps, they are temporal, so they many holes in space and time, therefore they can be aliased as well. So you need to be able to understand their limitations. But numerical models are tools, and uh, it's very, very important to know and understand the limitation of these tools. So that's what this talk is a little bit about going to try to address some of those things. So just very brief history, just to give a little bit of perspective, you know, primitive equations have been known since the 1900s. Um, the first weather forecast was done by Lewis Fraser, Fry Richardson in the 20s, and he used numerical methods, but by hand, in order to provide the first forecast. Then the first weather forecast was by Charney in the 50s, the first ocean models, the uh, so-called Brian Cox Seppner, was initiated first in 1969. The Earth Simulator, which, I mean, it's a kind of a landmark in a sense that it really, truly made the global eddy resolving models uh, on the map for everybody was in the 2000. And the first, what I call 3D operational uh, system, uh, was in 2007. There were other forecasting systems at uh, either higher resolution but with simpler models or um, coarser resolution like one quarter degree or one eighth degree before that. But the standard one tenth degree that is used by most operational center, the first one was in the, by the Navy, US Navy in uh, 2007. So here is you know the first forecast by uh, you know so use a delta T of about 12 or 24 hours. Uh, but was actually, you know, truly numerically unstable, even if they were able to do a forecast by hand. If we go to the first uh, electronic, in quote, computer, the ENIAC was initiated by von Neumann, and the first 24-hour forecast 
uh, in the 50s. This is a picture of the computer they used, and I'm sure most of you know why you, know, you have a bug in your code. And the reason is because those mechanical electronic computer, uh, I think once was uh, sensitive to the fact that a bug decided to make a nest or something, or eat one of the wire. So, and uh, here's the first paper. So the ENIAC computer used 15 by 18 grid points. So a resolution of 700 kilometers, or seven degrees, which is pretty uh, time step a few hours. Be careful with the numerics, but it showed that weather prediction was uh, possible, and that paved the way for more complex weather models, but as well, ocean prediction as well. So in the case of uh, Godet, uh, we presented that at the beginning. So the main goal is to uh, facilitate the interaction between the scientists and the operational center, so to really promote the scientific development behind operational ocean prediction. So two goals. One is application of state-of-the-art to um, extend the predictability of coastal regional subsystem using uh, larger scale models. And the other one is a little bit um, to provide also ocean estimates that can be used for um, coarser resolution models to provide longer term uh, prediction. So requirements for this is if we are looking at what we tendency to call the ocean weather, by analogy to the meteorology, is that we need very high resolution uh, model that can depict all the mesoscale and possibly the sub-mesoscale. So accurate sea level representation is also very important if you're going to provide accurate boundary conditions to very fine coastal uh, ocean models. And then in the case of seasonal to interannual forecast, which is becoming of interest, which is of interest uh, as well, is you need a very good representation of the upper ocean mass field and often needs to be coupled to an active atmosphere. So where do we stand right now? So high resolution 1 12th degree to 1 50th degree is what is currently the standard. Uh, they are mostly used for ocean weather or seasonal to decadal prediction. And the emphasis has been mostly on short integration, so years to decades, and most of the time they're uncoupled to the atmosphere. So you use a prescribed atmosphere coupled to a sea ice model, and uh, that's pretty much it right now. But the focus is more on the surface field representation, possibly the addition of tides and everything. Course resolution, quarter degree to a degree, those are more like to explore IPCC type of scenarios. They are usually long integration, and they're coupled ocean ice uh, atmosphere, focus on the 3D fields, the meridional returning simulation. And a point I'd like to mention is the minimization of numerically induced apical mixing. You want to be able to keep water mass um, <coughs> from drifting due to numerics uh, as much as possible. So effective resolution. So we speak a lot about 1 12th degree, 1 50th, 1 degree, and so on. What does it really mean? First, there is an intuitive aspect, aliasing. If you take a sine wave and you have three points there in the middle, you think you may have resolved it, but actually you don't have any signal in it. So you, you may want to have at least quite a few points for in between in order to... So if you have a two delta x, which is twice you know, the, the, the grid spacing there, may not be sufficient to resolve a wave on the two delta x. The other aspect is that you have uh, as you write uh, a numerical code, the algorithms, you have inherent smoothness or inherent filters within this. And um, so that implies that you actually do not necessarily, um, res you know, just tool delta x is not sufficient to resolve features. So effectiveness about six times the grid spacing is what you can really count. I mean, on, uh, on it, it, vary it depends on the model, but that's kind of a, good start. So if you look at 1 50th degree, which is about one and a half kilometer at the uh, mid-latitudes, you actually can resolve truly just the beginning of the sub scale at 10 kilometers. 1 12th degree, which is the most common uh, right now, gives you about 35 kilometers. And uh, so you have some mesoscale features that are reasonably well resolved there. So if we look at this map that uh, put together by Bob Halberg, um, based on, if you consider that you have the Ross Beer radius of deformation is a pre the dominant scale based for bar clinic instability, 
and you have only two delta x, that's not even the six delta x I was mentioning before, you see that uh, at the equator it's fairly easy. You have the Rossby radius of deformation is pretty broad, so you, but one twelfth of degree, which is the current operational systems here, you can go up to uh, for two delta x about fifty north or something like this. So it's only when you go to one fiftieth degree that you can resolve most of the, um, or at least you have two grid points per uh, Rossby radius of deformation. So let me give you a few examples right now. So global 112 degree, which is eight kilometers at the equator. Usually when we refer to this, it's a regular grid on a Mercator projection matched to a tripolar grid around the, the, the poles. So uh, they're pretty much routine. What I mean by routine is that most of the, um, when, when you do global ocean prediction in the, in <coughs> Most of the centers are running at that resolutions. I'd like to present a little bit some of the work that is being done with tides. So either 1 12th degree with tides or 1 25th degree, which is going to be the next generation US Navy ocean prediction system in 2018. Because it's demanding, not necessarily in computer time, but by the fact that you have to store the data every hour or um, in order to really keep track of what the tides are doing. And then some of the 1 50th of degree, um, that's really pushing the envelope. Uh, worldwide, you have only three simulations. The first one is the one that Baylor presented uh, earlier this week, done by the MIT GCM. They have done only two years, but they have tights as well. So I think they have uh, petabytes, two petabytes of uh, data stored. And, uh, and then you have two North Atlantic configuration. One it done by uh, NEMO, four-year integration, the Grenoble Group, and the other one, the HICOM, 20-year integration, but with much less vertical resolution. So. so the point is that the ocean numerical models now are so sophisticated that the uh, outputs, the storage of those data, it can really be, it's a challenge on how to explore them and everything. So we need to try to explore to work with big data, with other things on how to mine and extract the information, especially if you start to store them every hour. Okay, so this is the classic 112th configuration. This is an example provided by the Mercator group. So that's a velocity at 25 meters from the base on the NEMO model. And what you can see that it is what we call an eddying model. So it's eddy resolving at most latitudes, not everywhere around the globe, but you see the train of uh, tropical instability waves, agrolis eddies, the Gulf Stream, the western boundary currents are well represented. So it's a good you know, uh, first approximation to what we believe the ocean is. Now let me give a few um, examples about uh, I think the next big step that was taken was the addition of tides. That's work that uh, led by Brian Arbeck, but with a lot of collaborators. So what you see on the right and side is the uh, fast-moving biotropic tides and biotropic uh, waves. And on the left is the steric signal or the internal wave uh, signature. And uh, then I'm going to present the same image that uh, Rosemary just showed a little bit before. But this is where the uh, internal tides, the M2 bioclinic tides, are located. And an example that uh, was shown. If we zoom in a little bit on this section, you can see the train of internal tides in the model here. And then here's a signature based on the true color sunlight picture. So you see that you know, the train of waves there that is in the model is also represented uh, in the, uh, from the observations. Now, the, um, this just, uh, OK, oops, here we go. Sorry, it's a little more challenging than I thought. OK. That's a challenge, OK. OK. 
Okay. One more time. Here we go. So what you see here is the relative vorticity and um, so in relation to F, the rotation here. So this is a, a 20 year high come run at 1 50th of a degree. And you see that is in summer. So in the, during the summer time, the mixed layer is relatively shallow. Then you have most of the features are uh, on the mesoscale range. So if we follow Rosemary's uh, slide from the uh, that showed the, you know when as the mixed layer depth increases, you start to see in March you start to see all where all the sub mesoscale and the very very fine features are uh, starting to show up. So. This is pretty striking. In the summer, it disappears. So you'll hear more about those simulations, both from Julia and I, um, in the next couple of days. So a few things. You know, this is starting to look very good. You know, when you look at SSTs, you compare SSTs from, you know, they look alike. But, you know, when something says, you know, model is only one representation of reality, and you need it, but you have the opportunity. And the second lecture I will give on Saturday will really show how sensitive those simulations are to the numerical choices that you make. If good modelers or any of you, if you use a numerical model, just try to understand the limitation to that model. That, you know, there are strong points, bad points, you need to know that. The main difficulty, as far as I'm concerned, is to quantify the truncation errors that are induced when you discretize the, the equation, the primitive equation. Some quotes, you know, I found this uh, on the web, so all models are wrong, but some are useful. Purpose of model is not to fit the data, is to, but to sharpen the questions. And I think that's very important. I mean, numerical models, um, can give you ideas, or if they differ from the observations, you can find out, are the observations alias, or is the models fundamentally wrong? What is the physics that's missing? One of the big questions is the spectra that uh, Rosemary showed. The models have tendency to show a k to the minus 3, minus 5, depending um, in the equator, pretty much systematically, and does not really agree with the observations. We don't really fully understand why. So, And, you know, the last quote is, um, you know, you can do a lot of numerical simulation, but that may not be very relevant to the question that you're trying to ask. So, numerical models. I mean, you have a lot of things behind them. You have the basic equations. One thing you should not neglect is uh, your model is only going to be as good as the way you force it or the lateral boundary conditions. So you need to pay a lot of attention to uh, also those facts. And then how you analyze them. So, behind it, you need to, you know, you, there is a lot of, uh, I mean, you need, you need to use your knowledge of computational physics in order to do, use a correct algorithm to solve the equations. You need to understand the basic oceanography and what you're trying to understand, statistical physics, and like I already mentioned, the algorithm design. Then you have to choose equations, like Baylor presented uh, um, earlier this week. You, um, you want to remove the sound waves. Um, you, you want so do you go you know hydrostatic, non hydrostatic, boosiness, non boosiness, rigid lid free surface? I mean there's plenty of choices and you can keep on going. So vertical coordinates, I'll spend a little more time on this. Horizontal grid, you have many ways you can discretize, you can use spectral, finite elements, um, regular, generalized, a tripolar, a cube sphere. I mean there's so many options and you have to really decide which one is the best for the problem that you're going to address. The algorithm, you know, is it stable? What time stepping? The accuracy? Um, you go implicit, explicit, pressure gradient force, equation of states. I could spend a whole week going through each of those steps. So this is just a very broad brush. And again, the subgrid scale closure, you know, everything that is on the below the scales of your model, you need to parameterize. And um, like Bailey again showed, that has a strong impact on the solution. And I'll go back on Saturday and we'll also show some examples of where and why it does matter. So let me spend some time on the vertical coordinate because that's, um, that has a strong impact on the way the interior of the ocean is represented. So currently you have three, um, three vertical coordinates. The classic one, which is the one that uh, Brian Cox started, you know, you just slice your 
uh, the, in vertical in constant z uh, layers. The other one, which is uh, so another natural physical coordinate, is you have constant densities, so surfaces, so isopycnic layers, and then you can divide the ocean in that uh, aspect. Another commonly used that uh, John introduced uh, in the case context of ROMs is that you have coordinates that actually follow the topography. So they stretch in the vertical and they just uh, are tearing uh, following. So they all have advantage and disadvantage. So what is it that you uh, look at first? Well, the vertical coordinate must be monotonic with depth, so it needs to increase constantly. The changes in density due to numerics should be much smaller than changes due to physical processes. So I'll, that's a point that I'm going to emphasize over and over, is that the numerics introduce truncation error and therefore mix temperature and salinity. You want that mixing to be less than what is observed. So, that's, so um, <coughs> they need to coincid uh, coincide with uh, locally referenced neutral surfaces that's just again, to make sure that you advect along those surfaces with that without introducing additional mixing. And then another aspect that is important, but uh, the uh, equation of states also includes the effect of pressure. If you don't include that properly, then you have some errors in the pressure gradient as well. So just, you know, roughly we'll just go through the advantages and disadvantages of each of the approach. Z models is the simplest numerical discretization, and that's what has been used for since uh, you know the 60s, and that's I would say probably 80% of the climate IPCC scenario models use a Z uh, model, if not more than 90%. So the equation of state and the pressure gradient are well represented. If you have enough vertical resolution in the upper layer, you uh, have a, a good representation of surface mixed layer. On the other hand, the disadvantage is the representation of trace advection and diffusion along uh, inclined, uh, you know, along uh, isopycnals is difficult to do properly because you have to rotate uh, the tensor, so diffusion takes place along the isopycnals as well as for the and or if you advect temperature acidity in the horizontal, it does not necessarily mean that it's going to be exactly at the right location um, in the uh, isopycnic layers. And then bottom topography, you have steps. So this is not really natural, and therefore uh, that uh, <coughs> introduced some, uh, uh, some errors, and I'll get back to this. If I go to isopicnic layers, so tracer transports occur naturally along um, directions that are defined uh, by a local reference potential density. And if you keep tracking of that, that's what we call neutral surfaces. But to a large extent, potential density and neutral surfaces um, are fairly parallel to each other. And therefore, um, there is no spurious uh, numerical mixing when you use a purely isopycnal model. And the bottom topography is well represented. I mean, so, On the other hand, if you have a constant density layer, you're not going to be able to represent very well the physics that is taking place in well-mixed region. So if you have, like in the Arctic, where, for example, where the density doesn't change much, you cannot really represent the vertical, um, <coughs> the uh, velocity structure if, if you have a shear, vertical shear in those layers. And thermobaricity is a little more complex to introduce as well. Sigma coordinate models, so you have a very smooth representation of bottom topography, and it's a natural framework for to parameterize the bottom boundary layer processes, and that's what John was uh, mentioning earlier this week. There is some issues with it because if you are um, the because it's not a natural coordinate. I mean, the uh, pressure gradient is not naturally. Um, formulated in that coordinate, it ends up being the difference between two large numbers. Therefore, you have a truncation error when you make the difference, and that introduce, can introduce some uh, spurious flow, non trivial and physical current. Therefore, you need to have a fairly small grid size compared to the size of your topography. And then the um, 
you have spurious near numerical mixing if you're not careful, because again, you would vect along surfaces and they neither that are not isopignal, so you need to do also a rotation and everything. So in general, because of the, you know, because of pressure gradient error, you need to have uh, topography would have to be very very smooth, and then uh, sigma coordinate models are not used for global or long term climate uh, simulations. They are used for regional and coastal models at very fine resolution, where the topography can be well uh, resolved. So here is an example of. Um, uh, ROMs, um, I mean, that's about the spurious diapignal mixing. I mean, this is one example that's been shown by Patrick Machatello. If uh, you start with climatology, you run it for six months, and you see how big the salinity has evolved or moved away from climatology. And the reason for this uh, drift in that particular simulation is the advection uh, scheme that they use, which uh, as an implicit viscosity or diffusion, so that the that you, that moves tracers from one isopignal to the next. So one way to fix it, and they pr they uh, wrote a paper a little bit later on, is to separate the advection from the numerical dissipation or viscosity, and by rotating the tensor, and they're able to minimize that aspect. So, so interior mixing, it's very very small in the ocean. If we look at this cross-section in the Brazil Basin, it's, uh, you have small internal waves in those regions, and therefore those waves do not break, therefore the mixing in the interior is very small, and it's on the order of 10 to the minus 5 meters squared per second. If you have internal waves that propagates on the top of topography, they're going to break, therefore you're going to have more mixing, and then can be up to the 10 to the minus 4 meters squared per second. So, the so 10 to the minus 5 means if you take like a, a kilometer, kilometer cube and you take a hand mixer and you put it in the metal. That's what it is. It's very, very small. And um, so the main issue is ocean models should be able to maintain this or even smaller um, with the numerics. And the idea is that then you can parameterize things that are occurring at scales that are smaller than what you resolve. Isopignal models by definitions are fine because there's no for Z and sigma coordinates must always depend on the numerical integrity of the transport operator. So you need to be able to transfer UT and S along isopignals without spurious uh, creation, the spurious of um, <coughs> temperature and salinity. And as you increase resolution, what happens is that you become smaller and smaller scales, you have eddies, therefore you pump up and down your interface, and therefore the, numeric, the numerics has a harder time to follow, uh, follow up with this. So, been quite a little bit of. So here is the an illustration of this. If you have non-rotated diffusion, let's say like in a z-coordinate, you see you can advect the diffusion will take place across the isopignal. So you're going to mix in the wrong direction. So you need to first rotate your tensor in order to mix along the. That's for the diffusion part. And advection, if you have a fluid that's going to go from here to here, in a z-model is going to be here plus a W vertical velocity that's going to move it up here. Just the fact that this is um, a numerical approximation makes it not exact, and therefore there is an error associated with that aspect. So one way to quantify this is a uh, work that uh, Flavien Gouillon from a PhD of mine did, and then followed up by work uh, at GFDL by Ilikat et al. What you can do is you take a, the dam break problem with a lock exchange. Density row two, row one. This is very well known theoretically. You have a front moving left and right. No mixing should take place in an adiabatic context. So you have theory, perfect theory, and then you can design a problem where, um, <coughs> where you can look at the impact of uh, the choice of the numerics, uh, grid resolution, and everything. So that's a comparison between uh, ROMs and MIT GCMs, all, both of them run in a Z uh, mode. And we look at what we call course, which is two kilometers, you know, medium 500 meters and fine at 125 meters, and using different advection scheme, a third order and a flux uh, corrected uh, scheme. So here is one example for ROMs. And what you see 
is you know you have a nice propagation of the front, but at the interface you start to have some contamination, um, <coughs> and because ideally the red you should be only red and blue. There should be no uh, mixing taking place in the middle here. So this is an example that shows for a series of MIT GCM some ROMs with different data. And you see that when you go use the um, flux corrected um, algorithm and with very fine resolution, you have almost no mixing. This is what we are after. Okay? And this is, you know, if you're fairly coarse, you actually have a fair amount of numerically induced mixing. So you can try to quantify. I mean, this is an exaggeration because in reality, I mean, you don't have a lot of uh, contrast between two density that way. So that's an upper bound for the mixing that you can get in those models, but it gives you an idea of the impact of resolution and the advection scheme. So from there, you can translate this into equivalent uh, vertical diffusivity. And in, uh, so in red, it's about 2 tenths of minus 4. So 10 tenths of minus 5 is very small. It's mostly in the green part. And it's only when you get into the fine um, mesh and with a specific algorithm that you actually minimize that amount of dipicnol mixing. So the main point of this exercise is to show that the choice of your algorithm matters and that you need to understand how much numerically in the dipicnol mixing your model is going to do. Um, I mean, if you're interested in short forecast or in a well-mixed area, that doesn't really matter. But if you are performing long-term integration, it does matter. All right, so the other aspect is uh, linked with the representation of topography in, the, uh <coughs> in those models. So it also depends very strongly on the vertical uh, coordinate. In a fixed numerical, I mean, fixed uh, coordinate like Z or Terran following, it's um, uh, numerically induced entrainment can be often and is often much, much larger than what is observed. So the main goal, uh, because th what I talked about for the interior is actually enhanced in the presence of topography. So the main goal is to try to reduce the numerically induced entrainment to levels that are uh, less, slightly less than the observations. In density coordinate to isopicnic coordinates, it's the opposite. If you have a dense fluid that is going to fall down the mountain, it's going not going to mix at all with the outside. So you want the entrainment or the mixing that takes place when the fluid comes down. Um, so you need to parameterize that mixing. So in one case, isopicnic, you need to add mixing. In the other cases, most of the time, you try to reduce the numerically induced mixing to level that are observed. So. Here is uh, you know, the resolution that's a, after a slide from uh, Bob Halberg, GFTL. It shows that you, know, you need to have a delta Z of 50 kilometers, delta X less than 5 kilometers in order to avoid numerical entrainment. I mean, that's pretty much the guideline for z coordinate models. So we're barely getting there. We're not getting there yet uh, for global models. For, so there are many, many parameterizations that have been uh, proposed. I mean, the main reason what's happening is that, uh, well, I'll show in the next slide, actually, in more detail. Sigma coordinates, it's a fairly, um, it's similar. I mean, you need to both rotate the tensor and at the same time uh, minima, you know, have a <coughs> resolution that is adequate. In the case of isopicnal coordinate, it's not an issue. But if you don't have enough vertical resolution, uh, enough density layers, you cannot parameterize properly also the entrainment that takes place. So in z model, the main reason why there is an issue is that if you advect, so this is a step topography, and you have a fluid that is coming this way, what it's, it's going to be suddenly denser than the level that is uh, underneath. So if it's denser, there is convective adjustment that's taking place. Therefore, you mix. So the water that is now located here is not as dense as this one. And you keep doing this and this and this, and naturally, just because of convecting of adjustment, just the advection over the various steps, you have already mixed your water. So it's just a numerics. So what Beckman and Dosher suggested is that you actually decide that a fair amount of it has to be passed on to the next step topography. So it's a engineering fix that kind of works, but it's not, you know, it's, there's no, uh, uh, particular reason on how 
it's, it's difficult to define the criteria over which you actually do the mixing. Another approach that's been used for more uh, coarser model is using the Price-Yang uh, boundary condition scheme where you devise boxes in your model where you decide what is coming in, you mix with the interior, and then you prescribe, you have a prescribed depth at which you, um, you, you prescribe the uh, outflow. And that's been used for coarse uh, resolution models. But that remains an issue. So I know it's in the interior of the ocean, so when you do ocean prediction and you're most interested in surface fields, that may not matter that much. But if you want to an accurate representation of the 3D structure, that's very important to be able to do properly. Okay. Here is an example of an uh, isopicnic based uh, model. You see, in this case, you have it's a hybrid, so you have Z coordinate at the top and uh, isopicnic layers. So you have cold fresh water that is falling down the slope, but as it falls down the slope, it can entrain uh, salinity uh, water. So in this particular case, the water mass that fall down the slopes are well separated and you can entrain some of the salinity in it. Okay, so what are the solutions in order to try to minimize uh, numerically induced uh, mixing? So hybrid models with isopicnol interior try to keep improving the uh, advection scheme, the algorithm that we use. That's not yet really uh, done. And um, you can add some numerical closures. And uh, so, but that's especially critical for climate simulation, especially in the presence of mesoscale eddies, because it, but it's a longer time scale. So if you do short-term ocean prediction, that is something that may not be as important. It needs to be taken into account. So what do we mean by hybrid? Hybrid can be a linear combination. You can do sigma z type of coordinates. Or I'd like to we'll mention is generalized vertical coordinate. You can you write your equations in general in such a way that you can discretize your model in z, in sigma, isopicnols, or any combination or any type of coordinates that you'd like to see. And that's a route that uh, most recent numerical models have uh, taken. HICOM has been doing this for the past 15 years, but now we have uh, MOM6 that uh, just uh, came out about a year ago that has also an ALE, which is arbitrary Lagrangian like Eulerian methods to deal with vertical velocity and the displacement of the interface. The EMPAS at Los Alamos go to at NASA, it's going in the direction. It's the main thing is that <coughs> with that approach, you can still run the model the way it was designed for, like in purely Z, purely isopec, no, but you also have the, the ability to choose other coordinates and evaluate with your numeric the impact of the choice of the vertical coordinate. So that's, you know, Reiner Black in 1978 wrote those equations. So S is the generalized vertical coordinate. So let's focus on the continuity equation here for a second. And what it means is that, so if you have a, a box, you have fluid coming in, so on the lateral side, it can either escape from the top or bottom, or you can increase the size of that box if you decide that the fluid cannot go across it. So the, the flux that is coming into that box either can go through the surface at the bottom of the top, so that's what you do in a Z model, you know, you have a vertical velocity that's going to, or the surface can move up and down. So if you have isopicnic layers defined, flux coming in, it can inflate. Okay. Or you can have a combination of both. That's what pretty much it means. So in the case of purely isopecnic, your bottom and the top of your box move up and down. In the case of a fixed coordinate, you have uh, uh, properties of the fluid are going to go across the, the interface. And here's a practical implementation of the way it's done in uh, MOM6 and uh, HICOM, <coughs> so what you do is the dynamics, you go in time, that so you have an evolution of the interface. So if it's purely isopecnol, you keep it that way. But if 
is you want to go back into Z, what you do is you do a vertical interpolation of your properties, move, shift back your interface, and redi redistribute the TNS in the vertical. And that's what the ALE methods allow you to do. So it's flexible, and you can have any type of vertical connect that you want. So here's a little bit of a movie. That's a, what you have is a 2D structure. So this is a channel, and you have wind that is blowing up on the top. So you have an upwelling that is taking place. This is a purely uh, Z model. So you see that the upwelling is uh, taking place. The cold water is raising up to the surface right here. This is a sigma Z. So you have uh, le levels in the middle and um, terrain following in the coastal region. So same thing. You have a flow. And here, this is a purely sigma. So roughly, all those approach gives you the same uh, representation of temperature and salinity. But what I'd like you to <laughs> focus on now is the transition as it takes. Uh, so you, let's go. At the beginning, every, the, all the isopycnals are flat. They are going up. And here at the surface, where you want to have vertical resolution in Z, the, you see the isopycnic layers that smoothly transfer themselves into Z. So that's what the general, in this case, you have a hybrid of both Z and isopycnals that are meshing with each other here. So ideally, at least that's the philosophy that we've been put forward. We want the ocean model to retain water mass on centuries, on a long time. So this means that's a characteristic of isopycnal or density coordinate models, because there is no uh, mix interior mixing to the... You want a high resolution of vertical in the surface mixed layer. That's something that isopycnal models cannot do, but Z or Sigma can do well. You want also uh, sufficient vertical resolution in a stratified, a weakly stratified, and high vertical resolution in coastal regions. So one approach is to have sigma or terrain following coordinates in areas that are coastal, let's say less than 200 meters, for example. You isopycnol in the deep ocean and then Z at the surface. When you do that, this is a recent work by uh, the GFDL group using MOM6 on the left. So <coughs> this is for a coupled ocean atmosphere integration for uh, forgot 100 years. Um, and they look at the evolution, the temperature, and the drift over time. When they used is um, the purely Z uh, discretization, you see that the um, temperature in the upper thousand meters evolved all the way to 1.2, you know, moved away from climatology by 1.2 degrees. When they use what they call the high calm distribution of um, so where we put you know, the isopycnal in the interior, mostly Z in the mixed layer, the, I think the maximum is about half a degree. So they reduced the heat intake due to numeral mixing by a significant amount uh, by going there. They even played a little bit by you know, adding more Z level in it, but then in this case, the temperature drift increased right away. So that doesn't mean that the choice that we kind of made in the high calm uh, is optimal, but it's definitely, um, I mean, has a definite impact. The, so the, by trying to keep as many layers in the deep uh, isopycnol. So now let me go back a little bit to the, so what, what what I showed be before with the uh, is that you see how smooth. So it, it is Lagrangian vertical coordinate in the vertical when you use isopycnals at a mesh with a fixed depth coordinate model. Now you can imagine you can use any type of vertical discretization in the vertical. And that's what the group in England using a Fluid 80 HICOM did. And that's, that's again the dam break problem. But in this case, it's adaptive mesh. So the way they so you, you see the, it's non hydrostatic So in this particular case, you see the uh, Kelvin and mole instability taking place at the interface. But the way they start is that you have big uh, grid size 
where you have no motion of the fluid. And you increase the resolution where you need it, where you have strong vertical shear and everything. So the grid size is adaptive. You just put it where you need it to be. And that's, um, they have translated that into the uh, horizontal as well. So most of the models that are used for global simulation right now use a fairly regular grid on a Mercator projection with some exception, and I'll get to that. So, um, <coughs> so you have a lot of development into adaptive and unstructured grid that have taken the past. But, um, so what is the advantage of unstructured mesh is that it allows good representation of bathymetry and coastlines. Uh, there is a smooth transition between coarse and fine mesh resolution. And here's an example where you can see the finite elements. Well, it's pretty dark here, but as you keep zooming in, you see that it gets from coarser to finer to even finer. Okay, so that's one uh, aspect. The only issue is that it is inherently more uh, computationally intensive and also uh, a little more difficult to uh, program and to for the algorithm. Here's another version, which is the FVCOM, which is mostly used for coastal application, but they're running it in a global context. And again, you see the grid as it uh, goes from, as you refine it into the very, very, very fine scale in the estuary. So you can have communication from the outside to the uh, interior. A development that, has, that uh, is significant because uh, one very big modeling group at Los Alamos decided to go for it, it the isocohedral geosic grid. And a point that you know, Rainer Black made is that um, the early coupled model, you, know, you try to have the grid for the atmosphere identical to the grid of the ocean. And that allows a transfer of property across the interface without interpolation. As you increase the resolution in the ocean, different, uh, you, you, you have flux couplers that were derived, and those um, require very sophisticated interpolation to make sure that the integrated values of the fluxes are transferred properly um, across the interface. So the, um, one of the goals behind the iso using the isochoidal grid is that they can be matched uh, with the atmosphere. And the other part is also um, that it can, you can increase resolution fairly easily in many areas. So here is a, a little bit, I guess it's not, you see, this is an isochoidal grid, okay? And you can adapt it and increase the size as you go across the scale. So it's finer resolution here, in this case, around the, the uh, North Atlantic and um, here is a little bit the, so you can have 80 kilometers resolution mesh transition zone, and then 10 kilometer resolution. So the big question is that, is it what we want? I mean, um, if you're going to have eddies, I mean, do you care about what's happening outside or not? I mean, the, do you want a proper resolution of the um, barkling and stability throughout the world, or um, are you just interested in the region? Computationally, sometimes it's not that much more expensive. I mean, you, it, it, because the time step it can be the most limiting factor, so you're going to be slow anyway, even with a fine mesh. So there's just a lot of questions being asked right now on how to try to um, <coughs> take, you know, how to uh, use finer, you know, is, is it to our advantage to increase the resolution in specific areas in a global model, or are we better off by using two-way nesting uh, separately? So. so to conclude, I'd just like to remind you that there are many challenges, uh, things that I've not talked about. Um, interaction between the mixed layer atmosphere and subsurface ocean, that includes uh, mixed layer physics. You know, you, this is something that is also parameterized that I have not approached. Uh, marginal seas, topographic control of the open ocean. So that includes overflow or hydrography. Uh, the influence of open circulation on shelf circulation and ecosystem. John uh, talked about that uh, quite a bit. What is it that we do with the uh, coastal interface? Um, coupling of ocean, ice, wave atmosphere, 
when is it that we reach a point that uh, a prescribed atmosphere or just prescribed rivers, um, it's not going to influence our forecast. So, um, understand you have a large scale variability needs to be taken into account, the role of mesoscale, some scale eddies, how you initialize your ocean. So that matters, because if you have a bias in your TNS distribution, it's going to be there for a long time. Um, physically consistent for the uh, subweight scale parameterization, how do we replace, replace numerical closure like Bahamonic and uh, Laplacian with something that's more physically based and try to reduce the bias in monomeric. So just for thoughts, um, what do you think should be the next generation ocean models? So a lot of reflection that is taking place in the community as models mature. You st want to think about 10, 15 years ahead of time. And uh, that means, you know, do you want to go on structured mesh, adaptive mesh, seamless to way nesting? Uh, is ALE vertical coordinate the way to go? Or should we go adaptive in the vertical like I showed? Not another static option, when does it matter? Of course, we always want higher numerical accuracy and efficiency. You want sophisticated subway scale closures, but what is also extremely important is computational efficiency. And you cannot separate the development of a numerical model with the architecture of the computers that you use. Um, it keeps evolving. You know, you had vector computers, you had parallel computers, now you have GPU-based. Each time it demands, the numerical modelers have to adapt, rewrite their code so that they run um, efficiently uh, on uh, computers. There are questions about the Moore's law where uh, you know, <coughs> doubling of the, of the uh, computer efficiency every so many years um, that we may have reached a limit at that point. So it's not, uh, or you, so it's unclear that we're going to be able to sustain the increase in computer speed that's taken place in the past 10 years. So on Saturday, I'll give some examples, uh, the impact numerical choice on basin scale simulations. So either grid spacing, viscosity closure, boundary conditions, they still matter significantly. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. We are a bit late, so maybe we can take some short question. You will? Yeah. I was wondering if you could comment on the difference in vertical resolution in the two models that you mentioned that are resolving in the horizontal one over 50 degrees. One had 32 layers and one had like 300. Um, no, not yet, because this is uh, actually AJ was in the audience uh, together with Julia and I are uh, comparing those two simulations. Um, so, um, so to on Saturday I'll present some differences in the surface fields, and it's unclear if those differences are due to the vertical resolution in the vertical or some other choices that we made. So, thanks. To be continued. 